Hello and welcome to Live Science Live. I'm Mindy Weisberger, senior writer at Live Science. And today things are gonna get a little wild. <laughs> I'm, sure you, I'm sure you've never heard that before because joining me are Chris and Martin Kratt, creators of the show Wild Kratts on PBS. And they're gonna talk about their new one hour special, Wild Kratts, Cats and Dogs, premiering on PBS July 12th. Uh, Chris and Martin, thank you so much for being here. Hey, how's it going? Hi, <laughs> going well. So now, of course, because the special is about cats and dogs, uh, the first thing I have to ask each of you is cat person or dog person? <laughs> well, you know, that question is central to the adventure of the special. Oh, like perfect. On, on the episode, on the one hour special, we're all trying to figure out if we're cat people or dog people. So I can't really reveal that here. You'll have to watch uh, an hour special. <laughs> <laughs> but what about you? What are you, a cat person or a dog person? Uh, well, I, I am fond of dogs. I think dogs are fine, but uh, I am and have always been a cat person. I've uh -huh. only ever owned cats, and uh, yes, cats are very close to my heart. Yeah. I thought maybe you were a bat person with your pendant there. <laughs> well, I am a bat person too. I'm also a cicada person, but yeah, you, you, you bring that stuff up and, and people just, you know, it's like you don't get the same kind of, you know, like, oh yeah, cats or oh yeah, dogs. They're like, what yeah exactly what? you like what? <laughs> yeah and you know that's one of the reasons like we like to do episodes on those kind of creatures like mm -hmm. bats you know we did an episode on vampire bats they were in our halloween special and just to show the really interesting and cool things like i didn't know this before i started we did the show but vampire bats are the fastest running bats they move on the ground faster than any other bat which is really cool I did not know that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway, back to cheetah, cats and dogs. But... Well, cats and dogs, these are these are animals that many people yeah. see every day. But there are, of course, so many different kinds of amazing animals that are out in the world that people, you know, would never get to see except for perhaps, you know, possibly going to a zoo or potentially seeing them on seeing them on TV. Absolutely. You know, and and one of the neat things about cats and dogs and the reason we wanted to do a show on them is to really kind of show people where their pets came from. You know, so we really go back to the wild cats and dogs, the different species of wild cats and wild dogs and and where our pets came from and also like the traits they still have in common. We also have a lot of fun with figuring out, you know, in our in our um, people world, we all think that dogs chase cats. But in the wild, different cats chase different dogs, you know, and it has a lot to do with who's bigger than who. But, you know, cats have more weapons with all the claws. So, you know, that we have a lot of fun with that, with cats chasing dogs and dogs chasing cats. And a lot of the big cats are, are bigger and more powerful than the than the biggest dogs. So we're not we're, I guess we having having our pets aren't used to that not, not so much <laughs> yeah so, so what are what are some of some of the, some of the similarities that uh that people might be able to see in their own pets looking at uh, looking at the special and seeing the cats and dogs there well you know for example the dogs the social behavior you know dogs are pack animals mostly you know, you know there are some individual more solitary ones but but mostly dogs are pack animals so when they're living with you they see the family as a pack and they try to fit in and and be part of that you know cats are a little more solitary so you get that kind of aloofness sometimes although anybody who has cats knows that cats can be very very affectionate too right oh, of so, course yeah and, they and, are and also them. lions lions are a social cat and they have yeah. special greetings where they rub each other's cheeks so so cats can be social too but yeah they're yeah. far more solitary than, than than dogs generally one thing i learned because like well we were doing finishing up the show during the pandemic and i got a kitten and a puppy during the pandemic and one thing i noticed was that kittens tend to explore the world with their paws and dogs tend to explore the world with their mouths oh interesting that was kind of interesting <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay so is, so is that something that you see that you see parallels in in uh in wild animals as well yeah i think so i think so because you know you know cats all the cats they catch with their paws right and the dogs more they catch with their mouths so it's just such a basic part of being a cat or being a dog yeah, this spring we've been hanging around at a a fox den, and they're they're members of of the dog family, and they like one of the things they like to do right now at the age they're at is grab little little bones and and bits of fur around the den and 
toss them in the air with their mouths and then jump on them and pounce on them. So they're practicing a lot of their hunting skills, but they're using, they are using their mouths as kind of, you know, to manipulate objects and to try yeah. to yeah, and so so it looks like an adorable game is actually them practicing a very deadly and lethal behavior. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yes, that's so if you have, and if you have a fun. puppy that chews your furniture, chews your socks, that's just them exploring their worlds, you know. So you can't get mad at them. Yeah, and if no. you have a cat that waits around the corner till you walk by and then attacks your your feet or your legs, that's them <laughs> with their being instinct. wild. Yeah, yeah being wild. <laughs> Yeah, so this is this is how people can look at you know can look at their pets and they can you know they can make that connection for themselves to you know wild behavior that they may not, yeah. they, they may not necessarily appreciate their pets doing you know to their furniture or to their feet. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so some of the things about some of these topics are pretty complex. So you know animal behavior, animal biology, evolution, and and then conservation issues. Once we start talking about wild animals, you know, these are all these are all fairly complex topics. So so what are some of the challenges of telling these kind of stories in a way that makes them accessible and relatable to uh, to kids? Well, one of the great things about animals teaching science concepts is they they all use science in their daily lives and it's such like a easy relatable way to teach science for example peregrine falcons they hit their top speeds of over 200 miles an hour because they harness gravity skunks use chemistry for their defense right so you with animals you can get into any science concept and the animals mm -hmm. demonstrate it some way with their creature powers or their different abilities and that's really what wildcrats is all about Yep, and even on like electricity, you can teach with animals because electric eels have these organs in their bodies that function like natural batteries. And when they complete the circuit, the electrical current, they stun their prey. So, um, so yeah, we can teach, and animals can take you anywhere in science, and that's what yeah. we do. But the but the difficult thing, you know, in 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 writing a wild Kratz episode or creating a wild Kratz story is is to you know weave in the natural history information and the science concept just as seamlessly as possible into the story about the animal yeah mm -hmm. and we always try to have one science like curriculum in our story woven into all the fun and adventure and uh and connection with animals okay yeah and, and actually you mentioned you mentioned uh, the the you know the pandemic year that we're all just coming out of now and so the you know the, the last year in particular has been an especially challenging one where lockdowns restrictions have made things a lot harder for you know, for most people and uh and, and and including you know connecting connecting with nature and wildlife and so um so do, do you have any any advice for ways that uh, that kids or, or anyone can can rekindle that interest or those connections after maybe stepping back a little for the last year? Well, you know, a great thing, a, a great thing about creature adventuring is you can do it while you social social distance and stay away, you, you know, from, from other people if you need to. So getting out into nature throughout the pandemic has been like a really great thing that people can do. And one thing that we've always um, been really sort of, sort of proud about is that a lot of parents you know make comments to us about the show and are are grateful because the show like sort of gives the family an activity to do together and that's creature adventuring just going out in nature and looking at animals or the zoo or even on imaginary creature adventures to africa just having fun pretending so um so that's an activity you can do during the pandemic or not and anywhere you are, you can always find a tardigrade, whether it's in a crack in a sidewalk, <laughs> moss on a tree. <laughs> you know oh, we love we love tardigrades at Live Science. I actually I almost wore my tardigrade necklace. You have one? I wow. have a tardigrade necklace, yes. That's amazing. Yes, no, tardigrades are fantastic. Is that is that are, are tardigrades on your list? I mean, obviously they're they're very, very small, but but you know, is you that something that you Okay, yeah, we, okay. we have an episode about them because they are they are one of the only creatures, you know, probably the the, the largest and most substantial creature that can survive in space. Yeah. And they they're in every environment on Earth. They can yeah. just survive extreme heat, any extreme. They can survive it. And in our tardigrade episode, 
the live action part, we just go outside at a university, a Carleton University, take some moss off a tree, go inside to the microscope, look in the in the moss and in the water, and there's tons of tardigrades. And there they are. Yep. Yeah. And <laughs> it's so cool. And so now having watched the episode, we we hear stories of kids in parks like looking at a tree and the moss at the base of the tree and saying, Mom careful careful against that tree there's a tardigrade living in that moss <laughs> well that, that's great when you can not only connect people with the animals that they've never seen before and may never see in real life but also just you know the animals that they overlook that are around them every day yeah, yeah. so great. other than tardigrades which are arguably just the best animal are um do you do you have uh do you have any um favorite animal stories of uh all of the uh all of the animals that you featured in uh in your work thus far Oh, wow. Huh. So well, going to Komodo Island and encountering Komodo dragons, like, and being surrounded by five big ones is, was a highlight. You know, it was very, very, they're amazing creatures, biggest lizard in the world. And uh, you got to stay on your toes when you're around Komodo dragons, because they'll sneak up on you. Oh yeah, but, and, and they're, they're venomous. Yeah. They're venomous too, aren't they? Yes, they, yes, they and are. They, and they only recently discovered that. You know, everybody had, had previously, you know, focused on the fact that in their saliva there are a lot of um, different different bacteria yep. and things, and they thought getting a bite off, you know, at least the wound would eventually fester. And being cold blooded animals, they could follow their prey until it until the the wound festers but they did recently discover there's also venom in the saliva so it's a double whammy but um but yeah when we were filming the uh the the dragons on moto island uh i i did get too close to one of them and it oh, no. ran ran towards me and i turned to run away and i i slipped um and fell on the ground accidentally and it started climbing on top of me and uh and fortunately i was able to skittle out from underneath and it didn't bite me or anything but well, uh, i remember that was you used your leg to push it up away from you and it was over you going like this trying oh, to get no. it <laughs> yeah. it was pretty funny yeah. Uh, well, but, yeah, funny, <laughs> funny now. Maybe not so funny at the time. Right. And after I after I got out from under this Komodo dragon, I looked at Martin and, and our cameraman, and they were just staring at me like, <laughs> and they hadn't filmed it, and they hadn't moved to help me. <laughs> <laughs> at the very least, they could have kept the camera rolling. I mean, come on. That's right. Exactly. Well, we were trying to get the camera in position oh. to film what was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the lizards just had other plans. Yeah. So, so, um, what about a what about a wish list of animals that you have not yet featured, but you would like to? Well, snow leopards is up there. Um, I actually personally would like to do an episode on ladybugs because they eat fly larvae. So, if you have ladybugs in your house, it's really a good thing. Those yeah. are two right off the top of my head. Yeah, and that's good. A, a bigger one and a smaller one. <laughs> Definitely for me, uh, gorillas is probably at the very top of the list right now. Um, that's yeah, And that's a small one compared to blue whales, which is also on my list. Which is also a good one. Yeah. <laughs> one thing, you know, we we like to think that, and, and, and we really mean it, that we want to do an episode about any animal i mean every single animal is interested and in, interesting enough to warrant its own wildcats episode for sure From and it's already grades up to the blue whales no <laughs> doubt and plus including their own creature power suits because yeah. every animal seems to have some amazing ability that they need for their survival you know like we we find like it's so easy to come up with stories because the animals are so interesting. You know, the animals with which we upon which we base the stories. Well, one one of the animals that that I've been seeing a lot of people talking about over the last few weeks are the periodical cicadas, brood ten, which have yeah. been which have been coming out in I think uh, I think fifteen states uh, across the northeastern U.S. and and that's something where a lot a lot of people who may not have you know before this may not have known that these insects even existed are you know are now aware that oh wait there's there's a type of cicada that lives underground for 17 years and then comes out for a couple of weeks in the billions what so amazing That's i remember cool. when we were kids in new jersey the the cicada emergence and mm -hmm. it was magical it yeah. was the coolest thing they were everywhere i personally love the sound 
and just seeing them everywhere. And then you see how all the other animals interact with them. It's like, whoa, there's so much food to eat now. You know, I saw so a friend of mine in DC birds. posted some, yeah, she posted some great photos of just squirrels in one of the parks with their mouths just crammed full of cicadas. <laughs> And some animals that don't eat them seem just as surprised and, and annoyed as some people are. Well, dogs and cats, actually. Yeah. A lot of dogs and cats just don't know what to make of them. Yeah, yeah. So back, so back to back to back to dogs and cats. So um, without uh, without giving anything away, uh, is there anything else that you can tell us about uh, about the cats and dogs special that's coming up? Well, one thing that's really interesting um that i learned from doing the episode is that there are about the same number of wild canid species wild dogs as there are wild cat species like each have in the area of 36 different species worldwide so it's a pretty even match they're both very successful carnivores you know different different groups of carnivores so that was pretty cool hmm. so so team cat team dog is actually yeah. more evenly matched than you know than you would think <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> all, right. all right well chris and martin thank you so much for joining us it's been a pleasure talking to you today and for all our viewers don't forget to catch wild Kratz, cats and dogs on pbs july 12th thank you thank you, you so much nice talking to you